Hello everyone, it's Monday and you're watching Within the Frame. I'm Kim bo -kyung. The number of sex offenders and the rate of re-offense in South Korea have both been on a continuous rise. To tackle this, the Ministry of Justice has come up with a new draft of the Korean version of Jessica's Law, designating specific places where high-risk sex offenders are able to live. Some agree with the new draft, saying people would no longer have to be fearful that a convicted sex offender will move into their district. Some disagree, saying it will violate their rights of residence and will punish them twice. What are the details of this new draft and what do experts think the pros and cons are? For more on this, we have invited Professor Song Sedan from Gyeonggi University Law School. Welcome, Professor Song. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. And we also have Professor Lee Yeon from Handong International Law School. Good to see you, Professor Lee. Good, thanks for having me. Thank you. Now, Professor Lee, first question. Uh, before we talk about the Justice Ministry's new draft, I would like to tap into where this law originated. The law is being called the Korean version of the Jessica Bill. How did this Jessica Bill get enacted in the U.S., and what does it say? Well, uh, this was a very tragic case in 2005 where there was a nine-year-old girl in Florida who was abducted by a convicted sex felon. And so in this particular case, she was abducted, she was kidnapped, and then you know, violated, and then eventually killed. And about less than a month later, you know, her remains were found in a bag. And it really caused a lot of shock uh, to the community in Florida about what happened to her, because this was a registered sex offender that committed these acts. And so her father, in this case, Jessica's father, Jessica Lunsford, her father then pushed for a bill within Florida to make sure that these kinds of events don't happen again, where you have a, again, a, a registered sex offender who was living in the area who then was able to then uh, commit this crime again in such a violent way. And so Jessica's law basically was an initiative made by uh, this father, concerned father, who then pushed it through the, the Florida bill as a law but basically what it means is in these kinds of contexts is there's a limitation in terms of uh, where particular sex offenders can live so uh, particularly in terms of the distance that you may be from a place where children are gathering so for instance at a school so some states uh, like florida have said you know within 2,000 feet a sex offender may not live in terms of their residence as well as you know, mandating certain kinds of penalties for sex offenders in this situation. So minimum uh, of 25 years uh, in the certain circumstances if you are uh, convicted of, of a similar crime. Uh, there's also notification requirements to local institutions like school boards and other places where there may be children around. So this law was first enacted in Florida and in many states around the United States then copied uh, this law and then you had different versions of Jessica's laws in, in many states in the United States. All right, I see. So it includes measures restricting sex offenders from living near schools and other places where uh, students could be around. Now, uh, Professor Song, the ministry's draft certainly has differences from the U.S., but before that, let's discuss the reason why the Justice Ministry came up with this law. I hear it is because of an increasing number of sex offenses. How serious is this? Well, if the report is right, uh, it's pretty serious. Uh, there has been a steady and also a pretty uh, quick uh, increase in the, the conviction of the sexual offenses. Um, I think the one lawmaker uh, mentioned that uh, it, uh, uh, in the last five years, uh, it uh, leads into tenfold of uh, convictions. Uh, but I, I think you have to kind of take into consideration that because of the high-profile cases, not to the Jessica Lunsford case uh, degree, but we have had uh, a lot of news articles and uh, instances where uh, public uh, are now and put a notice that uh, this is this is becoming a dangerous uh, environment. So there there has been some uh, enactment or the expansion of the law, especially uh, for example in the 2020, the statutory rape uh, range was uh, expanded. Uh, previously 13 years old, but now uh, in in many cases you can you can get uh, punished for. Uh, violating 16-year-olds, but also uh, 2021, the so-called nth room uh, 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 scandals, uh, that digital 
uh, offenses were uh, made into the, the, the law for prevention. So uh, because of those laws, uh, there are more acts to punish at this point. So that partly explains the, the increase, in a rapid increase. But I, I think you cannot deny that there has been as, uh, some uh, increases in, in, in this area. And also society's mood is that we have to be tough on crime uh, because not only the sexual offenses, but uh, the, the drug offenses and other violent uh, crimes is, uh, happening on the streets. So those uh, things kind of conspire to uh, make a, a, a right environment where uh, we have to act as a society and enact laws to uh, counter the, the occurrences of these crimes. Right. It's quite unfortunate to see how the number of sex offenses is continuously increasing. Well, uh, Professor Lee, let's now delve deeper into the details. What does Korean version of the Jessica Bill mandate, and how is it different from Washington's? Right. So as I mentioned before, the Jessica's law is a state law based uh, provision. So there's no federal law in the United States that's similar in nature. But with respect to sort of the differences and similarities, uh, naturally, uh, when it comes to Jessica's law in the United States, one of the basic provisions is mandated prison term. So as I mentioned before, 25 year minimum prison term for raping a child under the age of 13, and there will be 15 years for attempted rape in those cases. Uh, but the, the big issue, I think the big thing, thing that is, I think, unique about Jessica's law is the questions about where someone can live. So. As I mentioned, in the United States, it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but some places in the United States say even that you cannot be within 500 feet of a, a place such as a school, a place where children gather regularly, daycare center, for instance, uh, and goes from 500 feet in some jurisdictions to 2,000 feet in, in others. Uh, now, in the Korean context, however, the one thing that I think people, it stands out really, particularly in terms of difference, is while there is significant penalties for punishment with respect to sex offenders, the biggest thing I think in terms of difference will be the mandated sort of government run facilities that registered sex offenders may have to live in, uh, as opposed to, for example, living in their own personal homes. Mm -hmm. uh, a number of uh, uh, the government is proposing that in certain cases, where there's extreme situations where there are repeated felons, let's say you, you've committed sex crimes up to three times, you may have to then be in a government run facility uh, and designated in a place where you can only stay there and not live in your own personal residence. Uh, also, uh, this is not particularly related to the specific Jessica's law, but as part of the proposal of changes that may be done to these regulations, there's also a, a, a mandate maybe for chemical castration for very serious child sex offenders. And so in combination of those things, you see very big differences, particularly in relationship to where can, one could live, but also with respect to the kind of treatments and uh, that are available to put against sex offenders in these circumstances. So that's, of course, a very big difference than, let's say, what happens in the United States with these laws. All right, so we can see significant difference between Washington's and the Korea's. Well, Professor Song, we are now going to take a look at the pros and cons. Those who agree with this new legislature say people would not have to worry about sex offenders released from prison as they would live in state-designated facilities where their movement can be controlled more easily than just having them wear electronic anklets. Could you elaborate more on the beliefs of those who agree with this new law? Right, but this kind of law is uh, actually uh, will turn out to be a balancing act between the state's interest to, to protect the, the public uh, and the individual rights that even those uh, the offenders have. Now, we, as Professor Lee has mentioned, uh, explained, uh, these kind of laws uh, kind of put in to, to uh, different buckets of what to do uh, with the, the, the sex offenders. So there are tough sentences to begin with, uh, stricter parole control standards as, and chemical castration, as uh, Professor Lee mentioned. And also, uh, there's a, 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 a restriction on where they live. And in Korea's case, the, the draft uh, puts in a, a, a designated area. Um, so uh, it comes out to be, well, this is a, a draft stage, but it'll come out to be a kind of a different uh, combination of the, these facts. Now, those people who pro uh, 
uh, are proponent and and the supporters of this kind of legislation are obviously those who think that tougher uh, crime prevention is the way to go as a society. So uh, they would look at the each uh, uh, bucket and say, well, we do need the tougher sentences and also uh, stricter parole control and uh, where they live. And they will uh, maybe not they're worried less less about uh, their constitutional rights and especially uh, their freedom to move and uh, to, to choose to a place where they want to uh, put their home. So uh, I think that uh, where that the combination and also where that balance uh, comes out to be, I, I think the proponents would be pretty uh, pushing hard that this is right uh, uh, combination for Korea under the circumstances. Right. So this is uh, the supporters' point of view. Now, Professor Lee, let's take a look at some of the concerns regarding this new law as well. Some experts say this could be a violation of Korea's constitution as it excessively restricts sex offenders' freedom of residence. What is this about? Right. So as Professor Song mentioned, mm -hmm. this is, of course, a balancing between the rights of the public with respect to safety, public safety, mm -hmm. and then the question, of course, individual rights of those who are convicted. So in this case, uh, as referenced earlier, uh, we're talking specifically about Article 14 of the Korean Constitution, which states that all citizens shall enjoy freedom of residence and the right to move freely or at will. And so if of course, in, in, if the government is is going to impose this particular kind of, of I guess, punishment or sort of this sort of remedy for this problem of recidivism, uh, that you know basically these sex offenders may and will commit crimes again, then having them at designated government-run facilities will then potentially, of course, be a limit on their freedom of choosing where to live. And so the Constitution doesn't make any distinction between whether you're convicted or not convicted, right? Mm -hmm. This applies to, to everyone, whether you're a criminal or not. So you have a constitutional right. So in other jurisdictions, like let's say, I'll give you an example, in California, this issue came up where you had Jessica's Law and you had uh, restrictions on where certain people could live in terms of uh, within certain places. And so what they found out was a lot of these uh, sex offenders could only live in very limited areas because there were lots of schools, daycare centers, and therefore the question of con the constitutionality of the law came into place. And so in that particular instance in California, that particular provision about limiting where one could live was actually struck down in California. Now, it's been upheld in other jurisdictions, but that should give you some indication that this could be an issue as to the constitutionality of that particular provision as it relates to the limitations on the freedom of movement. All right, I see. So it can potentially violate Article 14 of Constitution in terms of freedom of residence. Now, uh, Professor Song, some have also raised <laughs> the issue of double punishment as those who already uh, served in prison might consider the residence restriction as another form of punishment. Is there a possibility that sex offenders could file a petition asking the Constitutional Court for a review? And if that happens, what would happen? Well, I think they do have a pretty a good argument uh, on this issue because uh, it seems like it's a different form of incarceration uh, when they come out and if they are forced to live in one area and that potentially will cut off uh, the, his contact with uh, even the families. So uh, there's a serious issue uh, about the right to travel and freedom of association. But uh, I, I think the minister uh, was saying that uh, this can be a result because these offenders will be in probation anyways. So under the probationary uh, requirements, if they have to be monitored, if there are violations of those uh, uh, the requirements, then they can be uh, put away. And one of the ways would be put it put into a designated area. However, uh, I, I think that uh, as Professor Lee mentioned, there is there are cases like California, but California tends to be liberal states anyway. So in a tougher state, uh, the the Supreme Court or the highest court uh, may come down with a very different result, uh, preferring to uh, favor the state's uh, duty to uh, protect the society. 
So I, I think there is a good argument for a, a, a constitutionality of this. Uh, they'll fight out, but I think it would depend on a uh, number of uh, uh, the points. For example, uh, whether they are given a choice uh, to live in those or they are forced. Uh, if they have uh, severe restrictions, for example, if they have to be home by uh, 9 p.m. every night, uh, probably that would be uh, too severe. But uh, if their living arrangement is such that under the circumstances that we have in a kind of a limited land uh, spaces in Korea, probably uh, that could come into a, a consideration in, in uh, judging the constitutionality. All right. But I, I, I think that there will be a good fight on this. Mm, right, I agree. Now, Professor, so one more question. The draft would also have to go through the issue of designating specific areas for facilities to house sex offenders with a high risk of recidivism. And as nobody would happily accept the idea of having such a facility near them, it will be very difficult for the government to select a place. What is your view on this? Well, th this would be a NIMBY in a very mm. extreme case. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think that the, the community would be up in arms about uh, housing this kind of facilities. Um, and also this is will be a case where uh, they'll be spending taxpayers money to house them and and um, uh, providing this kind of case. Uh, but I, I think that the fight uh, is come down to if we don't have this kind of arrangements then the, the communities will have to be uh, vigilant about those convicts coming into their areas, uh, uh, take a residence, but without the level of uh, monitoring or the, the guidance from the state. So it's, it's their choice. Uh, sometimes it's better to have a designated area that everybody knows that, that they are there and they'll be monitored and the state has the responsibility of uh, patrolling them rather than saying that, well, uh, we run the risk of somebody coming into the community without any restrictions. So I, I think this would be a, a very big awareness and the promotion issue as well, and then it has to be communicated and debated. But uh, I think that it comes down to what kind of benefits the society gets uh, by having those facilities uh, near their home because uh, obviously their property value will be affected. Mm, all right, I see your point. Well, uh, Professor Lee, so up till now we have been talking about many concerns that have been raised regarding this law, but already other countries have such a law, for example, the United States, as we have already mentioned. What is the situation like abroad? Right, so uh, many countries around the world do have specific sex offender laws, and most of them are in relationship to, for example, registering with local authorities as well as giving community notification that you are indeed a sex offender. And that's relatively common in many developed countries around the world today. Uh, and, but, you know, as we've been talking about in this discussion, uh, the really the big issues related to sex offenders is, again, they have individual human rights, even though they are convicts, uh, but also because uh, because of the high chance of recidivism, which the science has apparently proven that sex offenders, particularly of a certain kind, uh, are prone to to do the crime again over and over again without you know without stopping because for whatever reason they have a, a, a real problem with this really serious issue, and so the public certainly has an interest to make sure that their children are protected against such offenders, and so. Uh, the courts around the world, uh, particularly in the European context, have really uh, examined this issue on, on different levels. And so particularly I'm th thinking of here, the European Court of Human Rights has addressed this issue from a number of states. Uh, and, I, and I mentioned here that the Un United Kingdom has such rules that include notification requirements as well as reporting requirements. And in such cases, really the question is proportionality, right? So you have to think about, as we've been talking about, the balance between the interest of the public and protection, and the state's interest to do that for its people versus the individual rights of, of those who are subject to these rules. And so uh, the balance here, and depending on the jurisdiction, whether in Europe or in the United States or another country, is they use different legal standards to, to identify you know, what's appropriate, the appropriate balance to be made. 
And so in the European context, a lot of these rules have been upheld because the interests of the public outweighed, in this particular case, the individual rights of, of the convict because of the, the high chance of, of committing these crimes again. And so uh, I think the general trend has been across the, the board. Uh, while Professor uh, Song mentioned that California is a very progressive state, certainly many states have sort of really held fast to these rules and have upheld them within their constitutions. All right, I see your point, Professor Lee. Now, we are running out of time, but I'd like to ask this last question uh, quite briefly to our Professor Song. So, such a discussion, you know, is basically to contain repeat sex offenses. Could you give us any suggestions to make this stricter regulation even more effective? Well, I, I think that the, in, in the outset, they said there, there, there are many ingredients, uh, like the, 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 the chemical castration, uh, the restrictions, but oh, I, I think it has to start with the tougher uh, sentences and uh, the parole control. Uh, then send the message that this is a serious crime, that you should not do these acts. Mm -hmm. And after that, because uh, so, some of the sexual offenders have the medical condition uh, that they cannot uh, uh, control, so I, I think they, there has to be a wholesome approach where uh, if they need the chemical castration, they, they, they should. Uh, they need, if they need the, the living arrangements, range, I, I think that should be an option. But uh, with the, the tougher restrictions, uh, tougher uh, sentences, I think you can, you can give them a choice to take these so that you can take away a lot of the constitutional problems with this and make a kind of a uh, set of uh, ingredients to make it a good recipe rather than uh, uh, going out of balance in one or the other areas. Mm, I cannot agree more. Professor Song, thank you for your advice. And unfortunately, this is all the time we have for today's edition. Uh, thank you, Professor Lee and Professor Song for your time and insights. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that's all for Within the Frame tonight. We'll be back tomorrow with more in-depth stories. Thank you for watching and goodbye.